We're living in stressful times, and sometimes I find it beneficial to get away for a bit of a distraction. This current lockdown is quite strict in my state and can potentially have adverse psychological side effects. So it was nice to spend some time around a crowd of people just to feel their energy and share in their excitement. Of course, I don't own a TV and I'm aware of the old Roman phrase about bread and circuses, where cheap food and entertainment was used to stave off rebellion during the era of declining heroism of the citizens after the Roman Republic ceased to exist and the Roman Empire began. So I guess one should also be cautious not to get too distracted by public spectacles or celebrities, which is why I'm now on my way for a nice stroll in the park to reconnect with nature. While we don't really have a dramatic shift in seasons in Los Angeles, there is a noticeable change in temperature, and the holiday season always reminds me of the ancient esoteric origins regarding festivals during certain parts of the year, and their occult significance, which stretches back into prehistory. Many people take pride in their culture, which is a good thing. However, too much pride in any given perspective buries the common links that all cultures share, which tends to obscure the reality that they all stem from a common, once universal, source. The eight-spoked wheel of the year is an annual cycle of seasonal festivals consisting of the year's chief solar events, mainly solstices and equinoxes, and the points in between them. While names for each festival vary, similar rituals take place on the four solar events as quarter days, with the four midpoint events as cross quarter days. Among Wiccans, what many consider to be a nature based pagan religion, each festival is also referred to as a Sabbath. The people who call themselves the Wicca, or the wise people, practiced the age-old rites which were brought into Europe by waves of Celts, Druids, Scythians, among others, who are part of tribes collectively referred to as Aryans. In many traditions of modern pagan cosmology, all things are considered to be cyclical, with time as a perpetual cycle of growth and retreat, tied to the sun's annual death and rebirth. This cycle is also viewed as a micro and macrocosm of other life cycles in an immeasurable series of cycles composing the universe. The days that fall on the landmarks of the early cycle traditionally mark the beginnings and middles of the four seasons. They are regarded with significance and host to major communal festivals. These eight festivals are the most common times for community celebrations. While the major festivals are usually the quarter and cross-quarter days, other festivals are also celebrated throughout the year. In what are commonly referred to as pagan traditions, the festivals being tied to solar movements have generally been steeped in solar mythology and symbolism, centered on the life cycles of the sun. Similarly, Covens and other occult or alchemical sects are traditionally tied to the lunar cycles. Together, they represent the most common celebrations in most forms of neo-paganism, especially in contemporary witchcraft groups. Midwinter, known commonly as Yule, has been recognized as a significant turning point in the yearly cycle since the Neolithic or Stone Age or even the late Pleistocene, or 
Ice Age. The ancient megalithic sites of Stonehenge or Gobekli Tepe, carefully aligned with the solstice sunrise and sunset, exemplify this. The reversal of the sun's shortening days in the sky symbolizes the rebirth of the solar deity and the return of fertile seasons. From Germanic to Roman tradition, this is the most important time of celebration and of ritual. Practices vary, but sacrifice, feasting, sacred orgies, and gift giving are common elements of midwinter festivities. Evergreen or Christmas trees were brought into the home, symbolic of fertility in nature and spiritual immortality. Austera marks the vernal equinox in some traditions. This holiday is the second of three spring celebrations during which light and darkness are again in balance, with the light on the rise. It's this time of new beginnings and of life emerging from the cold winter. Midsummer is one of the four solar holidays and is considered the turning point at which summer reaches its height and the sun shines the longest. The sun, in its greatest strength, is greeted and celebrated on this holiday. While it's a time of greatest strength of the solar current, it's, it also marks the turning point, for the sun also begins its time of decline as the wheel of the year turns. Arguably the most important festival of the Druid traditions due to the great focus on the sun and its light as a symbol of divine inspiration. Druid groups frequently celebrate this event at Stonehenge. The holiday of the autumnal equinox among the Sabbaths, it's the second of the three pagan harvest festivals followed by Sowin, which I already covered in a video about the pagan origins of Halloween. Slovakia is a Central European country known for its breathtaking natural landscape, rich history, and numerous castles. Near the Austrian border, the capital city Bratislava is probably best known for its pedestrian-only Old Town, which only allows vehicles in at certain times to make deliveries. There are many bicycles, however, and it has a very pleasant medieval feel to the inner city with narrow winding streets, a hilltop castle next to the river Danube, and many historical churches to visit featuring just amazing architecture. On warm days, almost every cafe has an outdoor seating section in the street where Slovakia's most famous national treasures can be observed, appreciated, and admired. It's enchantingly beautiful women, which leads us to our history lesson. Born in 1560 into a famous family of Hungarian nobility, this story is about a girl raised with the utmost privilege, descended from what is considered by some to be royal bloodlines, 
that stretch far back into antiquity. An ancient family that has a notorious history of dark practices, including many incidents which took place in this Slovakian castle, now left mostly in ruins. Her childhood nurse was named Ilona and was said to have been a practitioner of black magic. And the word black in this context means hidden or secret, probably because it involved the sacrifice of children, primarily it would seem for their blood. Her favorite aunt was reported to have practiced witchcraft and she was married to a count at the age of around 14 or 15, but he was never around, so this aunt became very influential in her life, as was her uncle, a Luciferian alchemist, and her brother, who was probably best known for uh, pedophilia. So history remembers her as the Countess Elizabeth Bathory, a sadistic example of someone who participated in blood rituals and whose behavior, some claim, was the result of an unusually deranged upbringing, but may in fact be not that unusual and actually based on cruel practices which originated in a far distant and even prehistoric time. She was eventually sentenced to solitary confinement in the tower of her castle where she died in 1614 but not before authorities on the orders from the king himself collected testimony from more than 300 witnesses including priests, noblemen, along with other personnel that resided with her in the castle tabulating the number of victims to somewhere around 650 pubescent girls between the years of 1585 to 1610. The young girls were reportedly brutally tortured as the blood of virgins was a key alchemical component of her beauty regimen. So that number of 650 victims appears in a journal by Bathory herself citing her fondness for drinking and bathing in the fresh blood, earning her the nickname Countess Dracula. The legend of the vampire is also synonymous with another European royal, Vlad the Impaler of Transylvania, the 15th century ruler who first terrified, then drank his victim's blood, and although some sources state that Rather than drink the blood, he would merely uh, eat bread dipped in his victim's blood. But in any event, Transylvania turns out to have ancestral links to none other than Prince Charles of Wales, a little known fact that is now emerging after being publicized in a brochure by the Romanian National Tourist Office after allegations started coming to light about the private occult rituals of the royal family, which for the most part, if it's to be believed, resembles the sex magic, sacrifice, and blood consumption that did not die out with the ancient cults, but seems to have survived covertly and just gone underground. Thousands of tourists visit the town of the Brand Castle in Transylvania each year for a first-hand look of where Vlad III lived. Now, biblically speaking, ball worship is mentioned in the Old Testament as being practiced by the inhabitants of Canaan, and that later became known as Palestine, which is named after the ancient Philistines. Syria, Palestina, was a Roman province between 135 and about 390 AD, and it was established by the merger of Roman Syria and Roman Judea, and later reduced to just Judea. But Baal is described as a fertility god in most museums, universities, and books, and this description or title 
is justified by the well-documented infant sacrifices that were known to take place to a large metal bull deity that was made scolding hot with a lit furnace inside of it, which unfortunately ensured that the child suffered an excruciating death. And while it's correct that Baal was depicted as a bull man, I would argue that this particular sect could be linked to another people who deified a mythological bull man and they were separated by a short distance geographically, but distance by many centuries going back to the Minotaur of the Minoan civilization of Crete, which met its demise around 3600 years ago with the eruption of the Santorini volcano. The Minoan civilization was an advanced seafaring empire that flourished in the Mediterranean around four millennia ago, and by flourished, I mean totally dominated as a colonial power, and we can safely presume this for several reasons. One of which is the fact that their very aesthetically exquisite island capital of Crete, which was strategically situated among some other great empires around them, had absolutely no walls anywhere surrounding it, no fortification around them whatsoever, and many parts of this beautifully decorated and amazingly artistically designed city was preserved perfectly thanks to the volcanic dust which covered everything. And what we see is a people who are not worried at all about being attacked or invaded and instead seem to be a noble class of people or a race that themselves were very much feared or well respected. Much of their writing, which is called Linear A, that they left behind is still a mystery as it has not been deciphered yet. So a lot of what we know about the Minoans, which is not what they called themselves, comes from the classical writers of other civilizations. And many of them claim that this solar bull deity required regular sacrifice, often human. The term Minoan refers to King Minos, who in Greek mythology was associated with the famous labyrinth and the Minotaur, usually identified with the site on Knossos, the largest Minoan site on Crete, which according to Homer once had up to 90 cities on it. So this Minotaur was described by the Roman poet Ovid as being part man and part bull. King Minos was said to have constructed the labyrinth to house the Minotaur, a hybrid creature born out of the union of the king's wife and the bull, and while there's debate regarding several archaeological sites which exist on the island, each having proponents with controversial claims for why it's their site that is described in the text, there's no longer any credible debate as to the fact that sacrifices were made on the island and this is corroborated again recently by a skull found in the soil beneath Crete. The cranium belonging to a young girl dating to around 1280 BC which was found in pieces alongside skulls from some animals and during the excavation published in 2010 touting evidence of a ritual which included the sacrifice of animals and a young female, likely that of a virgin girl. And this is according to Maria Vesicki, the site's chief excavator and director of antiquities and cultural heritage for the Greek Ministry of Culture. While Minoan Linear A is still not deciphered, Linear B is, and stone tablets bearing references to Zeus and Dionysus were found confirming the cult of Dionysus in the Minoan civilization. The Dionysian mysteries included rituals carried out in ancient Greece and Rome which involved intoxicants and other trance-inducing techniques such as prolonged dance and repetitive hypnotic music which attempted to liberate the higher self or 
true self, the part of an individual that is somehow theoretically connected to everyone and everything else by distracting or subduing the ego. In some ways, this esoteric philosophy can be seen in certain shamanistic practices or even in the ritualistic prayer chants and dance of the Sufis, a mystical branch of Islam, even though it is denounced and not entirely accepted by many mainstream Muslims, by which they call it the destruction of the self, and by that I mean the ego's identification with self, or association with an individual's own self-centered reality, with the goal being to subjectively experience a communion with God. Now, the Minoan civilization existed during the age of Taurus of the Great Year, a term coined by Plato that references a roughly 26,000 year cycle known to most as the procession of the equinox, the path the sun takes through the 12 houses of the zodiac, rising in a slightly different spot each day, which traverses a different constellation roughly every 2,000 years. And when it has completed one cycle through all 12 houses, we call that a great year. The era of Christianity, for example, is often symbolized with the fish, which speaks to the sign of Pisces, the astrological era which started around the accepted date for the birth of Christ, lasting for roughly two millennia, which we are now transitioning out of and entering into the age of Aquarius. Now, before the Christian era, that is to say roughly 2,000 year period before Christ, or the age of Pisces, is known in esoteric or occult circles as the Aryan Age, which almost universally symbolized by the Ram. Now, before the Aryan Age, around 2000 BC or 4000 years ago, during the Minoan civilization, was the age of Taurus. Taurus the bull precedes Aries. And so the Minoans and their bull worship reflect this age symbolically. So in this context, it is not so much a bull god as it is a sun god, a solar deity, not just relating to fertility, but a solar cult when the sun is in the astrological house of the bull. That said, turning to the spectacular Minoan art, we can start to see why this race, which symbolically smeared red ochre paint on their white skin, as the men in ancient Egypt did, as well as the Phoenicians, which means red, Etruscans, Mycenaeans, as well as the swastika-adorned red-skinned Indians of the pre-colonial Americas, who were genetically related to the Basque and Berbers and were called redskins because of the red ochre paint they traditionally wore, who also had white skin, as these people were all from the same race that ruled the Mediterranean and made ancient transatlantic crossings. The seafaring Minoans artistically portrayed themselves as leaping over bulls in an arena. Does this activity remind you of anything? DNA sequencing has validated the genetic link between the ancient Minoans and Europeans, as Europe itself gets its name from Europa, a Phoenician princess or goddess which was allegedly kidnapped by Zeus in the form of a bull and taken to Crete. This tradition of bull leaping bears an uncanny resemblance to bullfighting which is still practiced in many parts of Europe today. Have you ever wondered why they must kill the bull at the end? What symbolically started this cruel tradition? The reason becomes clear when one ponders the fact that bulls are colorblind. So the Toreador that is waving around a red cape selects red not to get the attention of the bull better, 
but because the red cape is symbolic, associated with the Aryan solar deity Mithras, who kills the bull, ending the age of Taurus and ushering in the age of Aries. Prior to Christianity, Mithraism was widespread, including among many Roman soldiers, but it predates the Roman Empire altogether by many millennia. Here, we see Mithras in the center of the 12 houses of the zodiac, with the same cardinal signs as depicted next to other historic religious figures. And Mithras can often be found depicted killing a bull, symbolically ending the Taurian age. This same act is represented in the Bible, in the Old Testament, called Old because it predates Jesus and the events of the last 2,000 years. Moses, we're talking 3,500 years ago, punished his people when he came down from the mountain for what? That's right, worshiping a bull. So again, symbolically, punishing them or destroying the golden calf. This uh, scene, in my estimation, is another reflection of the solar mysteries, which some of you have oversimplified by calling paganism, but hopefully are starting to see that it's part of a much bigger and older picture than most have suspected, and definitely stretches past the Holocene into the Pleistocene. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments. So please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.